Uh, let's start. Welcome to Net Seminar. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Ali Gotzi. Uh, Ali comes from uh, KDH uh, Sweden. He's an assistant professor there. And also for the last three to four years, he's been a visiting researcher at UC Berkeley. And today he's going to talk about multi-resource scheduling and some very interesting work that got him the first prize at last SICL. So, thanks. thanks. Um, all right, so just a little bit of background. So for the three, four past years, I've been working uh, uh, in this area of multi-resource scheduling in general, not just in networks, but uh, I found it to be a rich area in you know, VM scheduling, uh, cloud computing, in this setting, and so on. So I think there's lots of interesting things one could do with uh, multi-resource fairness. So I'm hoping that this also can be applied in other contexts. But in this talk, uh, we're focusing on the network setting. And so this is uh, joint work with uh, Vyas Sekar who is now uh, an assistant professor at Stony Brook. Um, Matej Zaharia, who is a grad student who is graduating this year from UC Berkeley, and uh, Jan Stoker. So, the background of this uh, talk is that we're seeing that uh, uh, packet processing is becoming more and more complex and sophisticated. Um, so, some, some trends that we see, and I don't need to talk about this here, I guess, in Stanford, but uh, SDN uh, is used for you know, access control, VPNs, we see a profusion of middle boxes that are used uh, to serve uh, you know, enterprises, their own customers, and so on. But we also see that they use these middle boxes for external customers' data. So there were two papers at SICCOM, one in which they were uh, showing that the ISPs are using middle boxes to filter customers' data, and another one that showed that uh, cellular providers were using it for mobile data that's coming in. So these middle boxes are all over the place. We see uh, rising software routers like route bricks. And also more usage of uh, uh, specialized hardware, like uh, hardware accelerators. We saw the SSL shader project from NSCI. So all these trends have led to the fact that data plane no longer is just doing forwarding, but it's doing a lot of other complicated things, such as fingerprinting for WAN optimization, or HTTP caching, or intrusion detection, and so on. So given this, the motivation of this talk is that we think that flows increasingly, or network flows increasingly, are using heterogeneous uh, uh, resource consumption. So they're not just using one resource anymore, but they're using different resources. And I have uh, three examples of that uh, from the literature. The first uh, example is from uh, Vern Paxson, the Bro system, where they, uh, where they observed that uh, when you're doing these fingerprint computations for intrusion detection, uh, you can easily bottleneck on CPU. So CPU becomes a scarce resource. So there are a lot of complicated or complex computation you want to see. The other case is uh, from route bricks, and uh, they uh, observed that in route bricks, when you have really small packets, uh, you can actually bottleneck on memory bandwidth of the system. And finally, we have the classical case of you know that we've focused on in networking for the past decade, which is if you have large packets and you're sending them out without just doing mere forwarding, you can easily bottleneck on the link bandwidth. So these are three observed cases, and in the paper that we had, you can see we, we ran some traces and we actually confirmed that this is the case. If you do indeed, you can bottleneck on different resources if you look at uh, different middlebox functionality. Is it no sort of a sign that there are you know, kind of architectural errors in your system? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, you know, that there's a reason we don't push all packets through main memory in a network switch, right? That's sort of, because it's a stupid idea and, you know, it precisely overstresses the memory bus. And, and also, just your memory system in general, like, like, like scheduling's not going to help with that design. Sure, that's true. But the, as you know, some of the functions that you want to do on these middle boxes is really complex. So you, you end up, uh, you're, you're going to end up bottlenecking on something if you have a balanced system. They're trying to design these systems to be more and more balanced, so that you know, you could over provision everything else, but the band, you know, the bandwidth, but then you're wasting resources. So, so, and we've seen this in other contexts too. In the cloud computing context, we see it now too, that you, know, you can bottleneck on different resources. So, so, so given that, uh, we, we think that scheduling just based on a single resource is inefficient. And the problem we want to attack here is how to schedule packets from different flows when they have, when they, when their resource consumption is uh, heterogeneous. So they're consuming resources of diff different resources. Okay. So, another way to see it is how can we generalize fair queuing to handle multiple resources? So that's the problem that the whole talk is about. And there's a lot of work on fair queuing, as you know, uh, in the literature. So this next slide basically tries to put uh, this work in context of the related work. So we're building on lots of different things. 
So uh, the way you can see it, so the way one can see it is that in the case of single resource fairness, maximum fairness was suggested you know 50 years ago or something by uh, American philosopher John Rawls, and uh, you know he was saying in an economy we should help the guy who's worst off. An economist called this maximum fairness lexicon, you know, the lexicographic minimum. Uh, but it took uh, some time until 1990 or 1992 uh, before uh, in networking we generalized this to fair queuing so that we could do so that we could do time multiplexing. So what you can see is maximum fairness just gives you the allocation in space or the static allocation what it should look like. But how to do it in a dynamic system where packets are coming in and we need to schedule them and multiplex them? That that happened in 90 or 92, and that was fair queuing. And the way the, the main concept that they introduced was this notion of virtual time that we'll come back to. Uh, so that was fair queuing in the 90s. So can you concisely yeah. concisely state what what the criterion for maximum fairness is? Uh, I could. Uh, so in the single resource uh, case, uh, it's simply just find the allocation. What you do is you can, so the way I would do it is I would say you, you, uh, you sort a vector. You get a vector of all the flows in the system. I'm not asking for the algorithm, I'm asking about the criterion. Because you've yeah. a really interesting analogy that said you was, it was sort of like Pareto efficiency. And I, I wonder if you could give a clear definition of what the maximum fairness criterion actually yeah. is. Yeah, there are multiple of them. But one of them What's the one you're, you're using for the purpose of this? Yeah, talk? yeah. The one we're using is the one in which you pick uh, you pick the, mi the minimum. You always get the, it's it's one in which you found the allocation vector that is the minimum of the lexicographic vectors of all the allocations. It gets a little bit technical. There are multiple different definitions. What so, does that mean? Uh, I, I could go through, but I'll come back to it maybe in the second part of talk where I focus more on this because they're kind of technical the definitions and it gets even slightly more technical when you're in the multi-resource setting, but I'll come back to it. But intuitively, you can think of it as you want to improve the allocation of the flow that is worst off. Okay, you want to maximize the one that's worst off. Once you've do, done that, you recursively want to improve the, the allocation of the next flow that is worst off. You just do this recursively. Okay, so that's so so one way to characterize it is to say that when you are in the maximum, uh, when you have a maximum allocation, it is impossible to improve any of the flows uh, bandwidth without hurting some other flow that is already worse. Ah, see, that's a better criterion. That's like Pareto optimality, which says that we can't, can't, you know, reprice, you know, can't reallocate resources uh, to make every so that nobody, no individual person is worse off, right? Right. Yes. Right. But that's a good definition. Yeah. So that's what they did there. So more recently, um, we started looking at the multi-resource uh, problem, and others have looked at it too. The one we're, we're building on is this thing that we introduced called DRF, which is Dominant Resource Fairness. And what it does is it basically generalizes maximum fairness to the multiple resource case. But it's again just this static in space. If you had lots of machines, what would the right, how, how many percentage should we give to the different users if you have multiple resources and the users have different uh, utility over resources. Okay? So what we're doing in this talk is this box here, which is that we want to generalize, oops, we want to generalize these two. So we want to generalize DRF so that we can do it in time, so we have a dynamic system so that we can uh, multiplex packets to achieve these DRF allocations in time. We also want to generalize fair queuing uh, so that we can, uh, we, can, we can do fair queuing on multiple resources. So another way to see it is that we're basically taking this notion of virtual time that fair queuing introduced and we're generalizing it to multiple resources. So we want to have virtual time for multiple resources. So that, that sort of, that's what we do. Uh, so the outline of my talk is as follows. I'm going to start by going through some of the natural policies that we investigated initially. And we spent a lot of time actually looking around for different ways to do this. But uh, they turned out to not uh, satisfy some crucial properties that was identified in, in the past literature. After that, I'm going to go through uh, DRF, this related work that we're building on. Uh, and thereafter, I can introduce this DRF queuing. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about implementation now. Uh, so, so in the past literature, <coughs> Two properties have been identified as uh, important in the multi-resource setting. The first one is called share guarantee. And share guarantee simply says in this setting, in the network setting, that each flow uh, uh, can at least get one end to at least one of the resources. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the share guarantee. And it's, it's a straightforward generalization of the share guarantee that exists for a single resource, which is that you should be able to get one end of the single resource that you're sharing. Here we're just saying that you should get at least one of the resources that you're sharing. Um, and it's an isolation property, so it's a very important isolation property. It says that you know, no matter what you guys do in here, 
I will be able to always get this much. You can't hurt me beyond, you know, this is my minimum guarantee. Does it matter what the resource is? Yeah, so this gets kind of hairy, but what we, uh, what we will do actually, we will do something quite strong, is that we're, we're, we're going to actually give you one end. We're gonna, we, the way we will do it is we'll give you one end of the resource you want most of. So that's how we do it. Uh, the second property is uh, strategy proofness, which is that a flow shouldn't be able to finish faster by artificially using extra resources that it does not need. Okay, so that's strategy proofness. Um, and in some sense, weighted fair queuing from the past to the future is doing strategy proofness in some sense, because what, it, what they're doing is they're saying, I don't care how you packetize, how big your packets are. You're not going to be able to cheat the system by using bigger or smaller packets. You know? uh, so this strategy proofness is the same here, but we want to do it not for <coughs> resources. So let's look, at, uh, let's look at the simple example, the most, uh, the most uh, natural thing you would do, which is what many routers or middle boxes will do. So we're applying just basic fair queuing, and we assume that we only have two, two resources. So we have CPU and uh, the network, and they're being used serially. And by that I mean that when a packet comes in, some module starts processing it and it uses CPU resources. Once it's done doing this, it sends it to the link and then it's using link bandwidth. Okay. And uh, in particular, uh, these two flows, we have two, example, two flows in this example, and the two flows have uh, the following resource consumption. So the first flow, every packet that it has, first consumes two microseconds on the first resource and then one microsecond on the second resource, which is the name. And the second flow has packets that always use exactly one uh, microsecond in the first resource and one microsecond in the second resource. Okay. And assume that we're just, we just want to apply fair queuing and we're only applying it to the NIC resource. Okay. So if we're only applying it to the NIC resource and ignoring the CPU, then what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, these guys are actually using exactly the same amount of this resource. Every packet they have uses the same amount. So we're just going to alternate sending one packet from each of the flows. So let's see what would happen if you would actually start doing that. So x-axis here shows time, and we have the two resources, CPU and NIC. And we have the two flows, this uh, dark blue and the white, flow one and flow two. So first, it would start by uh, scheduling a packet from uh, the first flow, and it would take two microseconds. After it's done that, it alternates to the other flow and sends a packet from the other flow. Now, in parallel with this, since the first, pa first resource is done with the first uh, packet, the second resource can now start uh, processing the, the first uh, packet of the first flow. Okay. After that, again, it uh, alternates. So since it al it's trying to alternate, it's now going to pick one packet from the first flow again. And that one again uses two microseconds. And in parallel, again, uh, the, the, the second resource consumption of the first packet of the second flow uh, goes on. And this just repeats itself. So it's just alternating these like this. Okay. So we're going to get this pattern. And if we ignore this first time slot here, which is just a warm-up period, we're just seeing that this pattern is repeating itself over and over and over again. So what's happening is that since we're using more of the first resource, or we want more, there's more aggregate demand for the first resource, that's bottlenecking, and it's completely being used 100%, whereas the second resource is slightly unused. So if you look at the allocation that you're get, getting here, you're seeing that CPU is 100% used, and NIC is used 66% of the time. But in particular, if you focus on the second flow, it's only getting 33% of these two resources. Okay, because we're ignoring how much it's getting on the first resource, we're just applying it to the second resource, it actually got less than half. It's one end fair share of both resources. So this actually violates this basic share guarantee property. Okay, so, so we can't just use, the, but, I mean, use it for one resource. You, gave, I mean, you decided to give two thirds of the, two -thirds of the CPU to one, to one uh, flow and one third to the other, and that's what you got. So I mean, yeah. uh, it, it seems to me that you know, you schedule according to one criterion, so it doesn't make sense to judge it by another. Yeah, so we ignore the first resource, and hence it's being unfair, you know, because the first guy is using a lot on the first, and that's what's the bottleneck resource. So this is just a straw man saying that, you know, this, this wouldn't work very well, you know, if you're just doing fair queuing, apply to one resource. Uh, something smarter that's been uh, suggested by the literature is called bottleneck fairness, and they're saying that instead of doing it this way that I just explained, just determine periodically, what resource is currently the bottleneck? In this example I gave in the previous slide, it was the CPU. Okay? And then just apply fair queuing to that resource. Okay? Do this periodically. Okay? So let's see what happens with that. Here we have again an example with this bottleneck fairness. We have two resources, CPU and NIC, like the previous example. But now we have three users, and their demands are 10, 1, 10, 14, 10, 14 microseconds of the two different resources, respectively. Okay? 
So if you look at these three, if we just look at one packet from each of these flows, and we just look at the address demand for the first resource, we see that there is 30 <coughs> demand for the first resource, but the demand for the second resource, 1 plus 14 plus 14, is 29. So we're going to bottleneck on the CPU, right? So CPU is a clear bottleneck if we would take one packet from each of these. We couldn't possibly, you know, split equally the, the second resource because you see that, you know, the difference between is 10 to 1. So we would completely bottleneck on the first resource. So this is what we get. So if we, if we, if we think that the first resource is the bottleneck, we split that equally with fair queuing, then each of these three flows get 33% of that first uh, resource. And the second resource is almost split 50-50 between these two flows that use a lot of the second resource. And the first one is using a tiny bit in the bottom. And there's a little bit of slack in the middle because we're not going to the bottom of the bottom. Okay? Now, see what happens if the first flow artificially increases its demand on the second resource by some means. So it's instead using seven instead of one. Then what's going to happen if you do the same thing we did, if you add these up, you'll notice that you know, 7 plus four, uh, 14 plus 14, 35, is going to be the bottleneck. So we're going to now bottleneck on the nick instead. So if we look at that now, we see that uh, we're going to split. So we would then apply fair queuing to the second resource, split that evenly across these three flows, and you know, there would be a little bit of slack on the first resource. So what's happened now, what we can see now, is that uh, this flow, by increasing its demand to 10.7, is actually getting now more of both these resources. Okay? So it's being able to game the system, basically. So this is not strategy-proof. Doing this bottleneck fairness like this, it's not going to be strategy-proof because you can actually benefit by wasting resources. You can get more of all the resources. Okay? So that bottleneck fairness violates this strategy-proofness. Okay? So after this, we turned our attention to something that actually we actually wanted to try. And this, these two were, in some sense, straw man. But this is what we actually wanted to do. And we spent a lot of time exploring this policy which we thought was a good policy. What it does is uh, that you have a buffer between each of the resources you're using. Okay? So after you use the resource, you put, it, you, know, you put it in the next buffer and so on. And we apply fair queuing to each buffer independently. So we're just doing fair queuing independently on each of these buffers. Okay? And then we see what we get. You know, is it good, is it bad, and so on. Um, so it turns out that this per resource fairness that we tried also is not strategy proof. And the example is as follows. You have two resources, two flows with demands 4, 1, and 1, 2. I'm not going to go through exactly how the, you know, uh, how the interleavings look like, but you can just trust me that if you run this, what you end up with when you're doing uh, fair queuing on both of these queues, uh, you're going to get an allocation that looks like this. So, you know, flow number one is getting 57% of the first resource, and, you know, 14 of the second, and, you know, the rest goes to the other flow. Now, if the 4, 1, the flow with 4, 1, Artificially increases its demand to 4.2. So in some sense, we're now getting symmetric demands. One, one wants 1.2, one, another one wants 4.2. So if you ignore scaling, they're actually asking for the same vectors. Then, and you run the system instead with this first guy asking for 4.2, you're going to get the following symmetric allocation. So now, each of them gets 66% of the resource they want most of, and the other one gets 33 of that resource. So what's happened here, oops, what we see that happened here is that Again, by increasing its uh, demand, it's been able to get more of both of the resources. So it went from 57, 14 to 66 and 33. So per resource fairness also violates the strategy improvements. Okay. Uh, you might think that's not so bad. So I mean, we, we continue playing with this PRF. Uh, but uh, one of the things is that you know, uh, you know, if, if if flows waste resources, they can actually benefit in the system. But more importantly, this. PRF actually requires that you have a queue between each of the resources, and that was the main reason we abandoned it, to be honest. Because, uh, you know, oftentimes many of these modules consume resources in parallel. So you're using CPU and the network and, you know, in parallel. You're not doing them sequentially, so you can't force to have buffers between each of them. In which case, this, this, this method doesn't work. So this was the other reason why we, why we abandoned it. Okay? So uh, just a couple of words about strategy proofness, because this usually always comes up when I uh, talk about strategy proofness. People ask, you know, well, should we really care about this? Like, you know, does it really matter? Uh, and we think yes, because if you don't do this, you're actually encouraging wastage of resources. And wastage of resources essentially means that you're going to get lower good put in the system. Okay. Then some people say, usually when you say this, they say, that, well, but will anyone ever really game the system? Do people go through the trouble of actually gaming the system? And we think that, especially in, network, in the network setting, uh, this is quite common. We've seen you know, peer-to-peer -peer applications that do everything to you know, manipulate the network to get more resources. There are you know, applications like BitTyrant and so on. 
and it would be pretty easy to you know just probe different packet sizes and so on dynamically in a in, a, in an application to figure out whether you can get more bandwidth or not. So this is the second reason. And finally, I think one of the reasons we get these questions in general is that uh, this this for single resource fairness, it's trivially strategy proof in this in the sense that we're talking about. You know, if you ask for more, you're not going to get more. You know, uh, you know, you, you know, it's 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 applying maximum fairness. So you're getting already your fair share. So it's in the multi-resource setting that this appears. So that's why this 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 becomes relevant. Um, so skip this. Um, so let's look at uh, how we the, the policy that we actually want to implement. Uh, we're building on this thing called DRF, and I'll give you a two-slide uh, quick uh, summary of how DRF works. So DRF was originally proposed in the cloud computing setting. So we're, we have machines, and we want to schedule tasks from different jobs on these machines. And it actually satisfies both of these properties, strategy proofness and the sharing, sharing guarantee. Uh, and the way it does it is that it, it, has, it has two definitions. The first one is notion of a dominant resource. So the dominant resource of a user that wants to schedule jobs or you know, tasks in a cluster is simply the resource that she's allocated most of. Okay? That's her dominant resource. And to go with that definition, there's a notion of a dominant share. And dominant share is simply just the percentage of your dominant resource that you got. Okay? So let's look at a simple example. Uh, actually, okay, so before that. So what DRF does is it takes these dominant shares and it applies maximum fairness to them. So in some sense, what it's trying to do is trying to equalize the dominant share of all the flows or users in the system. Okay? Or applying maximum fairness to them, to be more uh, uh, correct. Okay? So here's a simple example. Let's say we had a cluster with 16 CPUs, 16 gigabytes of memory. And we had uh, two users. First user demanded to run lots of tasks, each requiring three CPUs and one gigabyte of memory. The other user wanted one CPU and four gigabytes of memory. So if you actually look, as soon as we start allocating these, the first user wants much more CPU. It wants uh, three sixteenths of CPU, whereas it only wants one sixteenth of the available uh, memory resources. So its dominant resource is CPU. The second user, <coughs> to do the same math, actually wants more memory. So its dominant resource is memory. These two users now have different uh, dominant resources. And what DRF would do is it would find the allocation that would equalize their dominant shares. So it would give you know, uh, 12 CPUs and 4 gigabytes of memory to the first user, respecting this 3-1 uh, uh, ratio. And it would give 3 CPUs and 12 gigabytes of memory to the second user. So what we see here is that it's equalized the amount that both of these flows got on, the dominant, uh, dom on their dominant resource. So that's uh, that's the RF in a nutshell. Any questions on this? Yeah, when is there idle time on your CPU? Um, so yeah, this gets into how you do this scheduling in these clusters. So here we're typically using CPU containers. People flows or tasks in advance tell you how much they want of the different resources, and then you isolate them based on that. But you could imagine a system where you would actually, you know, let this be used, you know, by other. So uh, yeah, that's a good point. So, so okay. So let's look at uh, so let's look at we want to apply this in, in this setting. So DRF is doing this in space. So it's doing this static allocation in space. Uh, but what we want to do now is we want to we want to do this in time. So we want to do it in the time domain. In particular, we want to multiplex packets to achieve these DRF allocations over time for different flows. Let's say in the middle box. Okay. So let's turn to how we can do this. Okay. So DRF queue. So DRF DRF queuing for. Uh, uh, for the for this uh, networking setting. So the first thing you bump into so are a couple of challenges that are new in this multi-resource setting that we didn't have with fair queuing before, and I'm going to mention them. The first thing that you bump into is that when you were doing fair queuing in the past, you always could uh, determine a priori uh, the packet link usage. So you would know how much bandwidth the packet would use as soon as it comes in. And the way you do it, you know that the packet size, you can just divide it by the throughput of the link. So you know how much it's going to use. In the multi-resource setting, we can't do that. So we don't, a priori, it's unknown how much a packet will consume of the different resources. It depends on many things. But the simplest one is, we don't know which modules will process this packet as soon as it comes in. You know, different modules in the system, you know, you know, depending on which ones it goes through, the resource consumption will be different. Okay. So this is the first challenge that you have to deal with. And uh, for this reason, we decided to leverage start time fair queuing, SFQ. And I will describe uh, briefly what it is. But the nice, the reason we adopted start time fair queuing is that what it does is it schedules packets based on their virtual start time. 
Okay, so it has something called virtual start time. And the interesting thing is that this virtual start time of a packet is completely independent of the resource consumption that that particular packet has. So you don't need to know how much resource it's going to consume in advance. Okay. So that's the reason we leverage SFQ. Um, okay, so we want to use SFQ, but uh, there are two requirements, two basic requirements that we need to satisfy in this multi-resource setting. One of them is old and one of them is new. So the old one, I'll cover that first, is the memoryless requirement. And this is a lesson learned from the virtual clock system uh, by uh, Mixia Jan. And the way virtual clock worked, this is 90s, I think 1990, uh, and the way it worked is simply that uh, it tries to simulate that each of the flows gets a dedicated one end link. Okay, that's what it's doing. And the way it does it, actually many of these concepts I've seen in fair queuing appeared already in that paper. So it attaches the start and finish tags to every packet. And it does it according to the simulated dedicated one end link that it assumes that everyone has. But then what it actually does when it's serving packets is that it's actually serving uh, the packet with the smallest finish tag. So it's using the full bandwidth, serving the packet each time with the smallest finish tag. So in some sense what virtual clock is doing is trying to be work conserving, which means use all the bandwidth while sort of simulating a system that is uh, reserving resources. You know, a virtual circuit kind of, you know, or TDM where you have reserved uh, your dedicated channels. Okay, so it's trying to marry these two concepts of work conservation and, uh, and TDM. Okay, so the problem with the virtual clock that's been uh, not known for a long while is that if the system has light load, so there are very few active flows at some time, you're going much faster than your dedicated one end simulated uh, network. You're going way faster. So then if new flows show up and start uh, becoming active, what might happen with a flow that's been going on for a long while is that it gets punished. It experiences a long delay or, you know, jitter. And you can see that intuitively. The reason it happens is that, you know, if, we ha if I have lots of backlog packets, you know, they get tags according to this dedicated link, but I'm going way faster. So at time 100, I might already be serving packets that have tags 200, because I'm going way faster, right? So my next packets have tags 201, 202, and so on. A new flow shows up and becomes active, and it immediately gets tagged, you know, at time 100, it gets tagged 100, 101, 102. So it's going to now have the smallest tags for a long while, until it catches up with the, with the active long flow. So you can actually get arbitrarily delayed in virtual clock. There is no limit on how much, how much you can get punished. Yeah. So well, that's bad. Well, it's not that bad. I mean, Linux CFS works exactly the same way. And it, the only real problem, is, I mean, this is a, a problem, but, and it also allows you to game the system, but in practice, it's not actually a problem, and that's why it's the standard scheduler for Linux. Yeah, but in, in the networking setting, you know, if you're doing video streaming, you know, live streaming, or you know, or you're doing video chat, and you've been running TCP for 10 minutes and you've got the whole link, then for the next 10 minutes, you know, another flow will get precedence over you. So I think in this very time sensitive where jitter is really important, it can matter. Actually. So it's, yeah, but, I mean, so what you're saying is that that uh, latency is actually a resource which should be which should be taken taken into account. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we want a system that actually yeah. gives some guarantees or some balance. Well, one might also place the blame on the application, which says that if you don't want to be penalized, don't use more than your fair share. Yeah. I mean, but, I mean yeah. typically app, yes. interactive apps on, on Linux sort of work that way. Yeah. 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 That would that, that that would be one way around. Yeah. Or have you played with uh, shortening the window over which you you you're tracking that virtual time. It's sort of a little bit like, like the global yeah. warming debate today. Well, yeah, you can some countries have done 200 years of polluting. Do you take that into account vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the other countries, or do you only count the last 10 years? And here, yeah. instead of your analogy back at 100 yeah. versus 200, if you're only tracking a trailing 10 or 20. Yeah. So this is very good. Yeah. You can so bound the delay, basically. Yeah. yeah. So you could just say, you know, we're just going to look for this long. And, you know, after that, we're just going to resemble. And we're actually going to use a similar idea later. Uh, but we, so yeah, so this is a good idea. We want to go to the extreme here. And this is what a lot of fair oh, queuing yes. papers. So we want it to be completely memoryless. So we don't want to look at the past and say, you know, because you use this much, I'm going to do this. So a flow share of resources should be completely independent of how much it's used in the past. Okay. Why do you think that's a good thing? I, mean, I, I sort of believe in the global warming thing that there should be a penalty for all this pollution that we did in the past. Well, here in the setting is in some sense, we had extra resources. These resources are not, you know, as we're assuming they don't call any externalities, right? You spend power right now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. That, that, if, that if power you include, is never coming so, back, right? Yeah, that's true. So if you include... Yeah, because, yeah. because you just have like 15 minutes and yeah, well, can yeah. we just defer questions for the end? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, I should probably speed up and skip some stuff. Uh, so, okay. 
Um, so this is the first requirement we had, memory <coughs> scheduling. Uh, the second one is more interesting, or actually, wait, okay. So yeah, let me, let me quickly go through how they fix this, how they achieve this. And the way they achieve this, and I'm gonna go quick over this, I mean, are you all familiar with virtual time or? Okay, I'll do a quick intro over virtual time. So the way they did it is that they said that, look, the system is not giving the same service. One, one unit of time means different things depending on how many flows are active, okay? So the main insight was, let's figure out how much service is being given at, at unit, you know, at, for each unit of time. And they introduced the notion of virtual time, which said that virtual time doesn't progress at the same rate as uh, real time. What it instead does is that it progress is such that each unit of virtual time always corresponds to the same amount of service for all the flows. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so in real time, if we have x-axis real time and virtual time in the y-axis, in the simple example where we have two flows, uh, if at time one we only have one backlog flow, it's actually receiving, and the system was designed for two flows, it's actually receiving twice you know, the service that it would if it actually only had you know, its one end or its half resource. As soon as another uh, flow becomes backlog, the slope changes to one. Okay, so we're gonna keep track of this with virtual time. So virtual time essentially lets us know where you would exist in this dedicated system. You know, it says that you know, at time 20, you're actually where you would be in time 40 if you had your dedicated one. Okay? And what uh, these systems, where they're queuing did is they schedule packet call packets according to this virtual time. So they would, when a new packet came in, they would adjust the starting time and finish time so that it would match the actual service that the system has been received. So, we would eliminate this memory less, uh, this problem with, that we had with the memory. Okay? The second requirement, which is new in the setting that we have, uh, is what we call a dovetailing requirement. And this is a new problem that you will have in the multi resource setting, even if you're not doing DRF or, you know, however you want to solve this. This is a new requirement. And the easiest way to understand it is that fair queuing said that we shouldn't, uh, flow size should determine service, not the packet size. In some sense, all of this fair queuing was doing over all these decades was trying to make sure that, you know, regardless of what packet size you use, you shouldn't be able to get, you know, different types of service. So, in particular, 10 1 kilobyte packets should get the same service as 5 2 kilobyte packets if they're backlogged and they're just being sent. Okay? So, in the multi-resource uh, setting, we want the same thing. We want, that we want to use flow processing time rather than packet processing time. And the easiest way to understand it is to look at these two flows. One of them is alternating its resource consumption from being 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1. The other one is just using 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, okay? We would like that two packets from this flow should receive the same service as one packet from this flow, okay? So it shouldn't matter how you discretize this over the packets. So this is the dovetailing requirement. And uh, so it says packet processing time should be independent of how resource consumption is distributed. So these are the two properties we would like to satisfy. One is old one, this is the new one. Unfortunately, it turns out that these two, uh, they're at odds with each other. So you can't really fully satisfy either of them 100%. Uh, you know, because dovetailing in some sense, this, you know, one, two, two, one, requires you remembering what was going on in the past so that you can dovetail. But then memory loss says you shouldn't remember anything from the past. So there's a trade-off here. And the way we solve this is that we basically de develop the RFQ in three steps. First, we develop a version which is called memory loss DRFQ, which is completely memory loss. But it doesn't do this dovetail. Then we have a version which is dovetailing the RFQ, which actually does dovetailing, but it's no longer memoryless. And then we have a generalization of these two, which lets you trade off between how much memoryless and dovetailing you want. Okay, so that's how we do it. And it's also easy to, easier to understand it when you go through it in this order. Okay, so let's start with the memoryless DRFQ. So remember what we wanted to do is we want to equalize the dominant share of the different flows. You know, what they use, the resource they use most of, that's what we want to maximize there. Okay? And so what we do is, just like all this related work in fair queuing, we attach a virtual start and a virtual finish time to every packet. And I'm going to tell you how we compute those. So they're called S of P and F of P for packet P, start and finish. So I'll start with telling you how you compute the finish one, because it's easier. The finish time of packet P is simply the start time of that very packet, plus the amount that it, that packet uh, is going to use uh, on the resource that it uses maximum. Remember, this is trying to emulate DRF. So, you know, P time of P of I is simply the processing time of that packet on resource I, and we want to take the maximum of that. So that's how we compute the finish tag of a packet. How do we compute the start tag? The start tag. So the way we do that is that the start tag of start tag of a or start time of a packet is simply the max of two things. It's the maximum of 
the finish time of the previous packet that is buffered currently. So if there are any packets buffered from this flow right now, we're just going to, this, this is simply the finish time of the previous packet. You know, so if they're backlog back to back, we just, you know, the start time of the next one will be the finish time of the previous one. So the maximum of that, and C of T, where C of T is the maximum start time of any packet that we're currently servicing. Not buffered, but we're actually servicing it. It's using some resource. And if there are multiple of those, we pick the maximum start time that there exists. Okay? So you have these two cases. And actually, what really happens with these two cases is that, you know, whenever you're backlogged, this first part will be the max. Okay? So basically, the start time will simply be the finish time of the previous packet for that flow. Okay? It's very simple. And if this is the first packet of the flow that's, that we're receiving, it's simply we're just going to set it to the current start time of the packet that's being serviced in the system. Okay. All right. Uh, and if there is no uh, packet being serviced right now, it's just zero. No. So we just set it to zero. Okay. So, uh, uh, and then what we do is when we're actually servicing these packets, we're just going to always service the packet with the minimum start time. Okay. So let's look at a simple example how this works. So these were the two rules for how to compute this. Let's say we have two flows, and they both become backlogged at time zero. One is alternating this one, two, two, one pattern. The other one is using 3, 3. Okay. So what's going to happen is that as soon as we get first flow's first packet, well, it's the first one, so we just set the start time to zero. And then when we look at the maximum resource usage, it's two. So the finish time is simply two. Okay, that's uh, this. This becomes two. Okay. Um, the other flow, first packet that it sends, again, start time zero. But the maximum it uses, the, the maximum it uses here, is actually three of these resources. So its finish time is three. Now, the next packets that are now coming from these, these flows, because it's backlogged, are simply going to have the same start time as the finish time of the previous packet. So, next packet that comes in here, the start time is simply the finish time of this one. Okay, that's what we get here. Uh, and again, you add two because the maximum is always going to be two, regardless of which of these two packets are being sent. So, you can see that, you know, it's just incrementing it, you know, start time equals finish time of the previous packet, and you increment it by two all the time. Okay? Similar here, but you're incrementing it by three because the maximum is three. Okay. Now the problem is if we ignore these first, which add zero time, we would like we said that you know we would like each two of these receive the same service as one of those. Each two of those receive the same same service as those. But as you can see, the start time of this flow is now much higher than this one. So they're not going to get the same service because we're always servicing the packet with the smallest start time. Okay. So this one got punished. So dovetailing is not working here between the one, two, and two, one because we're always assuming it's using maximum. Okay. So that's the memoryless uh, uh, memoryless uh, DRFQ. The dovetailing DRFQ tries to fix this, and the way it does that now is that it actually keeps track of start and finish time per resource. So every packet will now have a start and a finish time for every resource. Okay. And we're going to now keep track of how much it's using of the different resources. And when we're actually doing scheduling, we're just going to use the maximum start time across the resources for that packet. So here's an example. Here's a packet. Now we know how much, it, you know, the start time for that resource, the finish time for that resource, the start time for the second resource, finish time for the second resource. But when we're scheduling, we're just going to use the max of these always. Okay, three and five. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the same example again. Exactly the same example, but now we're going to use these two resources. Okay. So start time zero. But now the finish time is going to actually be, you know, one. It's using one on this resource, but two on this other resource. So start finish times differ here. You know, next packet we see that dovetailing is happening. Now it's using two, so we're adding two to the finish time of the previous packet and one to this. Okay, so you see where this is going. So it's actually doing dovetailing when it's computing these, and the red here is the maximum for each of the packets. Okay, and the other flow it just looks the same as before because it's actually using the same amount of both. So, uh, so if you now compare these two, what you can see is that these four packets get the same service as these two packets. So the start time here is the same as the start time here. So is that clear, or when did that go very fast? Uh, okay. So it's yeah. So uh, so you get the flavor. It's basically now we have virtual time for each resource instead of just having one virtual time. Okay. So what is then the RFQ? So the RFQ is simply that we want to we bound the amount of dovetailing to delta processing time. Okay. So what we do is we dovetail up to delta processing time units. So up to that, this dovetailing is happening. Beyond this delta, we're just being memoryless. Okay. So that goes back to the thing that you said earlier that you know we use a window sort of. No. Yeah. So you got that. So uh, yeah. So basically, now we have the RFQ. It's a generalization of these two extremes that I showed before. If you set delta to zero, 
you're always going to be memoryless. If you set it to infinity, you're going to be completely dovetailing. And what we actually do is we usually set it to a few packets worth of processing. Okay? And this is a two-node parameter. And, you know, uh, there might be smarter ways of picking this. But the reason we've set it to a few packets is that that's the amount of time that you have concurrency in the system so that buffers you know, actually allow you to actually achieve dovetail. You know, we don't want to set it to infinity because you know, uh, you know, if one flow was using one two one two one two forever for ten minutes and then using two one two one two one, we don't want that to. You know, you shouldn't be able to benefit that way. Okay, so shortly about the implementation, uh, and maybe I can take one question or something. Uh, so okay, so uh, we implemented this in Click. Uh, we ran the M seven fifty seven traces through these, uh, and the, this first experiment here, we just wanted to check what happens. You know. Elephant flows, do they actually affect my flow? So we had one, uh, two flows. There were one was doing basic forwarding, which is just basic forwarding. One was doing IPsec, which actually bottlenecks on CPU. And they were each set sending 40,000 packets per second. And for that particular uh, one gigabit link that we had, and the packet sizes of, I think, 1.4K per packet, that would completely saturate the resources on that, uh, on that uh, machine. And then at the same time, we had these two mice flows that would just send one packet a second. And they would just do basic forwarding, nothing else. And we looked at the latency that these would uh, receive. So the y-axis here is now logarithmic. And look at over time, the two uh, basic flows, the ones that the mice flows, uh, barely see any latency. So they have very low latency, whereas these two actually, uh, they're backlogged. So they're actually, each packet is sitting in the queue and, you know, seeing the latency. So it's the obvious thing. And you can also see that the one that's doing IP security is taking is, is receiving slightly uh, more latency. Okay, and uh, maybe I should also uh, uh, well I can quickly mention this one. We also simulated this bottleneck fairness for the same workload, and here we have an example where one flow was using one six and the other one was using seven one. And another bad thing that can happen if you're using this bottleneck fairness, which was if you remember that was the one where you try to determine what's the bottleneck and you apply fair tuning to that is that you get into these oscillations where you know it keeps jumping from one resource to the other because here it's really unclear there is no one bottleneck really both resources are a bottleneck when you have demands of this sort okay, you can't give 50% here and then assume you know then you would need you know way more on the second resource and we actually ran experiments with TCP here and saw that you know it actually affects jitter uh, so this is very bad for TCP as I mentioned earlier if you're doing you know audio or video traffic so in summary uh, uh, we're seeing that packet processing is becoming much more sophisticated. It's, you know, flows are using heterogeneous demand, especially in these middle boxes. And the natural policies we tried out, especially this PRF, either fail strategy proofness or they don't have sharing incentive, or they're hard to implement because they require buffers between each resource. And we proposed this DRFQ, which generalizes fair queuing to multiple resources, and also the concept of virtual time. Uh, and it gives you this trade-off between memoryless and dovetail. Uh, and also satisfies the two properties that I mentioned. So that was the last slide. So thank you. And, um, if you want to have. No, oh, up up until around 10. So have the oh, okay. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. A quick question. When you blended the two, the bounded memory mm -hmm. with the no memory, have you tried uh, if you turned it into a continuous time? That feels like a first order differential equation because one of it is on the marginal, on the derivative, the other is on the integral over mm -hmm. the flow, over mm -hmm. the packets in a flow. And whether that has a closed form that you, you land back on your feet with the data? So, is this for analysis or you want us, if you want to just, analyze just the. To see to what is going to converge. Ah. Uh, I mean, is there an easy enough we didn't model? Really, yeah, I mean, we didn't try this. This is an interesting thing we could try. If you want to analyze if there is a closed form, form formula, formula for how this behaves over time. That would be interesting. Uh, we didn't do it. We typically just set it to a very small value, and you know, we saw that it's enough to match what actual resource consumption is happening in the system. But yeah, that would be definitely an interesting analysis too. Uh, and also figuring out this delta, you know, because now it's kind of ad hoc the way we set it. You know, there might be ways to, uh, you know, because now also if you set it to some ad hoc value, maybe flows are able to figure that out and game the system using that. So, so that's uh, that would be another. <coughs> But it might even become more relevant in other settings. So, I, I, you know, it would be interesting to try this DRQ in general when you have, uh, first, if you're doing VMs scheduling. It's very similar. It's, again, time multiplexing, you know, and the VMs are using usually heterogeneous resources. So, that would be interesting. 
So one big difference between uh, network and you know, CPU scheduling is that in the network, the packet size is determined by the application, basically, or by the networking subsystem. Whereas in CPU scheduling, the time slice is arbitrary, although you could imagine it could also be specified by the application. So my question is, I guess, how does this change when you apply it? And, you know, is, is this relevant to CPU scheduling? And the, you, know, you said it's relevant to VM scheduling. How does it change when all of a sudden you have the ability, uh, which you didn't have before, to change the slice size? Yeah. So um, I don't exactly know. I haven't done the research. But uh, well, first of all, this start time pair queuing, I know they've applied to VM scheduling. So that turned out to work for that. But I mean, we could run into trouble here if we're doing it. But also, the second thing is, so you're saying you could decide when to preempt. But yeah. it's also that, you know. You can't preempt a packet, but you can preempt a CPU. Yeah. Um, now, there is, there is a cost, right? If you preempt it frequently, you have, you have more overhead. Right, right. So that gives you some flexibility. But then on the other hand, it seems that also sometimes, you know, it just abruptly all of a sudden, you know, uh, doesn't need any resources. So it's just blocking on some resource. So now all of a sudden, you, it doesn't need to use some resource. So it seems, yeah, it seems that there is, it goes in both directions. I don't know, it should give you some more leeway to do better scheduling. Maybe you can, you can then prove better bounds. So I didn't go through the bounds here. In the paper we have some proofs on the bounds that you get with the system. So I think you could probably improve those. I think the bounding idea is a good one. The bounding slash window idea is a good one. Like I said, it's not something that's used in, in CFS, but, but perhaps it, I mean, and, and practically that means it's just pushed back to the application, which is that all applications have the equal chance to gain the system yeah. if they want, yeah. and it's considered to be fair for sure that for that reason. But you know, in some sense, that's that seems like a bit of a work on it to force apps to do that. So maybe having the window would be a reason, yeah. and having it be a tunable window might be a good thing to add yeah. to it. Yeah, definitely. No, the window idea is good, and especially as you mentioned, strategy proofs might be even worse in VM setting because now we have different tenants that are actually using different apps. Yeah. So I was thinking that you, you most of your results are based on steady state flows, meaning like long lived flows. Mm -hmm. If you have bursty flows, it seems like the form of dove tailing uh, that you're doing seems to benefit uh, bursty flows, right? Because they basically can accumulate some credit when they come, they go through this burst, and they enjoy that burst, right? Yeah. And enjoy speed boost every time they come, yeah, right? Yeah. And that should cause some oscillation. Have you yeah. looked at uh, how that cause oscillation on the flows? Yeah, uh, let me see if I have. Because probably there is a maximum we want to set the delta to be. Yeah. Anything more can actually cause flow starvation on the other flow because the other guy accumulate enough traffic to basically burst through yeah. and stop the guy for a while, right? Yeah, so one thing that I didn't mention very clearly is that, uh, well, so first of all, we, when we run the M75 traces, they're actually, they're bursty flows, and, you know. Yeah. So in the evaluation, we actually run a real trace through the system. This, the examples are stylized, you know, where everything is backlogged to get the intuition for how it works. Uh, but uh, so you don't get any dovetailing if you're not backlog. So you don't get so the dovetailing will not. You cannot accumulate it as soon as you no longer have buffer packets. All dovetailing is gone. So you shouldn't oh. be able to benefit doing that. Okay. So I don't think that the bursty ones actually benefit from this. So that is the yeah. part where you basically yeah. cut off the big yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think they better benefit from better latency during the time that they're utilizing the channel. Yes. And it, so yeah. latency is this other issue, which yeah. isn't this other sort of resource in some sense. But my question is. How is this? Uh, how is this affected when your uh, when sort of your, your outgoing or incoming bandwidth is varying, uh, perhaps drastically over time? You know, say you're on a wireless link, or say you have a shared upstream link, like from Stanford, and all of a sudden a bunch of people start running BitTorrent and then they right. switch it off or whatever. Right. How does how do you take that into account? So there, I mean, we don't really do anything. We don't do anything. But leveraging start time fair queuing is what actually buys us. So one of the reasons SFQ was suggested was that many of the previous fair queuing algorithms. Uh, assume that you know you have a fixed bandwidth, so they don't work very well when it's varying. So the wireless setting they don't work well. They don't also work well in the hierarchical setting where you know some parent you know uh, class in the hierarchy all of a sudden starts using more resources. Then the amount available to a sub part of the hierarchy becomes less. So start time fair queuing since it's 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 kind of subtle, but the, the this CT here, the fact that it's using this means that you're always basically uh, synchronizing your virtual time to what's actually happening in the system, how much resources are available. So we get this benefit for free out of uh, start time fair queue. Yeah, but but like, do you understand what I'm saying? That a single packet still goes out at one gigabit, yeah. but your upstream bandwidth may actually be yeah. a real bottom. Right? Yeah. Right, so, yeah. So, so, so in some sense, you don't have any way of measuring that upstream bandwidth because you, you can't actually, you, it's, you really have to look at, uh, at flow completion time rather than packet completion time, but you don't know how long your flow is going to be. 
So that's a big problem, I think. Well, we, we just measure, well, so this assumes that we know for each packet. So this gets into another thing that I didn't mention much, is how much does each packet consume? And that is, a, you know, what, what is, and accurately getting that. That's, that's hard. Uh, that's actually a hard problem. I, I didn't mention much of that. You know, it uh, might have backup size on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the way we did it is, you know, because that actually, I think, is a whole other paper by itself. Yeah. Have you considered other resources like power and cost? No, we didn't. But, uh, but other people who apply DRF, I mean, uh, have used DRF for other things, you know, uh, and applied it to those concepts, you know, contexts. Uh, so this is the thing. This is the, one of the problems is that we really don't know how much a packet consumes. You know, and if we use CPU counters or something like that, it would be way too costly. You can't really do that. So that's actually another challenge that you have uh, in this setting. And so this is a separate problem, really. The way we solve this, we actually do linear estimation on the processing time. So what we do is, you know, for each module M and each resource R, we actually look at the, as a function of the packet size, we try to estimate what resource consumption is. And for the resources, you know, these two resources, CPU and memory, turned out to be, you know, really good fit. So you can, you know, linear regression work really well. So we just assume that, you know, from the packet size, we can tell how much you're going to use on this resource. Uh, but, you know, this is a way you can game the system, you know, if you're off here, you know, uh, so this is, this accurately, you know, determining resource consumption is, is, is a difficult problem. So are there any thoughts of putting this into Linux or some, some way that we can get it? Um, <coughs> I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not doing that, I mean, because, uh, <laughs> I mean, not because, I mean, I, it would be an interesting thing, but uh, there are other applications of this DRF that I'm investigating, like the hierarchical setting and so on. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to do it, I'd love to you know, work with them. But uh, uh, not right now. Uh, it's so DRF is implemented in the latest Hadoop, so it's it's shipping with the in the Hadoop setting, but that's not for the networking uh, context. Yeah. So, but here I think one could follow up and do some smarter things here. So you could do, for instance, occasional probing using CPU counters to get more accurate, uh, you know, than this very simple linear thing that we use. And also, this linear thing will break down for certain other resources like this. Which you're not, you, hopefully you're not using that much in a router, but uh, but yeah. Do we have one last question? If anyone wants to ask? Well, this account, right? Can you think about back compensating yeah. this uh, miss error? Because you do not know in advance, yeah. but you do know when the packet gets processed. Yes. So if you actually do that, you can actually track like different flows and back compensate it to the yeah. later flows, right? Yeah. So of course that is going to cause some jitter, that's going to cause some delay, yes. but. I think system-wise, yeah. maybe estimating this is going to be just too hard, right? The yeah. way is basically feed it back to the algorithm. So we do this. Sure stable, yeah, right? this is a very good idea. We yeah. do this. We have this token token bucket scheme, scheme yeah. in which we actually look at, you know, in the past, and we change the amount of tokens that we're using that we're granting to the different flows to, you know, because you know this could be the whole line could be off. So yeah. we have a sort of a way to deal with this, but but I think it's far from optimal because I mean very far because. We, the way we saw it is that this is sort of orthogonal. It's important to get this working, but we wanted to understand, you know, how, how should we get this working, just the scheduling. Uh, but yeah, these, these issues about resource consumption in the multi-resource setting, I think, uh, they come up in other contexts, and there's been some papers about this too. So yeah, this back compensation is, I think, a good idea. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.